Hey guys, this is Seth Gruber with Unaborted. Welcome to the show today. Thanks for tuning in. If you're not already aware, this is a show and a podcast, which is really a community of unaborted human beings. Human beings who ourselves have not been aborted, which is the great irony of abortion, right? As Ronald Reagan said, I've noticed everyone who's for abortion has already been born. And so we as unaborted human beings who are grateful that we have our lives want to be defenders of life, but we need a place of encouragement and equipping to continue engaging effectively on the battlefield of abortion. That's what this show is all about. So thanks for tuning in. This is a special episode from Standard Reason's Rethink Apologetic Student Conference last month in Southern California at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And Standard Reason has been doing these student apologetics conferences for years, and we have 2,700 students signed up. And I all of the breakout sessions on abortion, of which we had nearly 600 students between the two sessions, who had almost never heard a defense of life before and how to engage effectively. And so Stand to Reason is focused on equipping and training Christian leaders, parents, and young people to defend their faith and values in a gracious and winsome manner so that they can be salt and light in culture and be ambassadors for Christ on their university campuses. So welcome to this special episode of Unaborted, episode 8. 18 from Stan Teresa's Reading Student Apologetics Conference. Thanks for tuning in. Good morning. How's everyone you doing? You excited to be here? Do you know that this is the largest Rethink Student Apologetics conference in the history of these conferences? And you're a part of that. You're a part of that. I'm actually pretty jealous. As a youth student, I didn't have anything like this growing up. So it is an honor to be here with you, and I'm so excited to be partnering together with Stand to Reason and with you guys who are the future of the church, who are the present future of the church, who are being equipped and trained to defend life, to defend the gospel, and to be salt and light in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars. And we're here to help you shine brighter this weekend. So thank you for being here. My name is Seth Gruber. I'm on staff with an organization called Life Training Institute, and that's exactly what I do. I help equip and train Christian leaders, lay people, young people like yourself to defend life, to be a voice for the unborn neighbors in our midst. So yes, we are talking about the issue of abortion this morning. This January is going to mark 47 years since abortion was made legal in the United States of America. The result, over 60 million little babies in the womb have had their lives taken from them as they were slowly ripped limb from limb. This is the reality of abortion, and as Christians, we're called to defend life. We're called to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So by raise of hands, you guys, how many of you would say that you think it's wrong to kill a baby the day before the baby's due to be born? By raise of hands. So a fully developed nine-month baby, 24 hours from being born. Good, I'm glad you all raised your hand. And to us, that seems like a pretty self-evident truth, doesn't it? That's why you all raised your hands. Of course, There's only six inches away from the womb to when that baby's born. That's so self-evident. Of course it would be wrong to kill that baby that's fully developed, maybe on the way to the hospital to be born. But friends, sadly, many, many people today would not agree with you. Sadly, many people in our country, politicians, actors, musicians, Teachers, philosophers, professors, and sometimes even pastors would disagree with you and refuse to raise their hand in response to that question. We as Christians and you as Christian students face immense challenges in defending life on the university level, where many of you are about to head off to, on the cultural level, and yes, on the political level. 
Because sadly, you guys, our culture celebrates abortion. Our universities promote abortion. And one political party in particular fights for abortion. Fights for the legal right for parents to schedule the dismemberment of their unborn babies. This is the reality that we live in. And if you're a student right now, you are a survivor of the abortion holocaust. That is both sobering and joyful. It means that you made it. It means your parents chose life for you. You're alive. You weren't aborted. But it's also sad and sobering because statistics have said that about a third of Americans are missing. Where are they? They were aborted. A third of our country is missing since 1973. That's when abortion was made legal. I am, you are, a survivor of the abortion holocaust. And yet we are going to face immense challenges on these three fronts. The cultural front, the university front, and the political front. And so I want to give you some flashpoints from each of those battle fronts. So you're aware of what we're facing. I want you to be equipped to engage a culture of death. And to be equipped to engage, you have to know what type of people you're engaging with. You have to train before you go out onto the battlefield. And to train requires education. You need to know what we're facing. So culturally, our culture celebrates abortion. There's a movement right now, you guys, called hashtag shout your abortion. Just a few decades ago, if a man got a woman pregnant and they weren't married, they got a shotgun wedding because they wanted to avoid the shame of anyone knowing that they got pregnant before they got married. You can say goodbye to that. Now it's shout your abortion. So I want to show you a little clip that represents what we're facing culturally. This is a little clip of an abortionist who describes himself as a Christian abortionist talking to a woman by the name of Martha Plimpton. Now, you may not know her name, but if you've watched the movie The Goonies, she's one of the child actresses in the movie The Goonies. And I want to show you this little interaction to show you what we're facing culturally. Let's play that clip. Now, uh, Seattle has some... Uh, particular uh, significance for me for lots of reasons. Um, I've got a lot of family here, some of whom are here in the audience tonight. Um, I also had my first abortion at the Seattle Planned Parenthood. Yay! Notice I said first. I said first, and I don't want Seattle, I don't want you guys to feel insecure. It was my best one. <laughs> Heads and tails above the rest. If I could Yelp review it. Shout your abortion. This is what we face culturally. No more of abortion being safe, legal, and rare. Now the mantra, the rallying cry, is shout your abortion. Oprah Winfrey had the founder of the Shout Your Abortion movement on her television show to give you a little bit of an insight as to what we face culturally. We also face immense challenges on the university level. Many of you are preparing. Many of you are visiting colleges right now trying to decide where you're going to go. Maybe it's a Christian college. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a secular university campus. Regardless, you are going to face challenges. Those challenges may be three, four, or tenfold on a secular university campus as opposed to a Christian campus, but you're going to face immense challenges either way, and I want to give you a little example of that. There's a man by the name of Peter Singer, and he's a philosopher, author, and professor at Princeton University. And Peter Singer is popular for his public support of infanticide. Peter Singer is popular for writing about how it should be okay to kill babies up to one year old because they don't meet certain criteria for human value that he says you have to meet to have value. And he wrote a book called Rethinking Life and Death several years ago, and here's what he said. Human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping their lives over time. They are not persons. Hence, their lives would seem to be no more worthy of protection than the life of a fetus. 
So not only does Peter Singer support abortion to the day of birth, he publicly supports killing infants up to one years old. This guy's paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to teach philosophy at, to a university campus to people in your age group. These are some of the challenges we face on the university level. And friends, these are not just ideas that happen in ivory towers, meaning these are not just ideas that professors talk about in big leather armchairs as they talk to their students and smoke a cigar. These ideas have consequences. These ideas don't just happen in a vacuum. They don't just float around in your mind without impacting how you live. Ideas have consequences. Ideas inform how we live. And bad ideas have victims. If you believe bad ideas about human value, that may impact your support of abortion. If you think that babies aren't valuable from the moment of conception in their mother's wombs, these ideas have consequences. And sadly, friends, many leaders in our country today agree with Peter Singer. People who help make policy for our country would not raise their hands when asked, is it wrong to kill a baby the day before that baby's due to be born? And so this is the last challenge we face on the political battle. And I want to give you a brief example as to what we're facing politically as Christians on the issue of abortion. In February, there was a piece of legislation proposed by a very pro-life senator by the name of Ben Sass from Nebraska. And it was called the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. And it means exactly what it sounds like. The bill was intended to help ensure protection for babies who were born alive during failed abortions. Meaning that the abortionist tried to kill the baby in the womb and he failed and then the baby was born. And there have been some abortionists in our country who have been arrested and charged with murder for killing infants that they failed to kill in the womb. Think about that for a second. So this senator said, we need to pass a bill to better protect these babies. Pretty reasonable, right? All the bill said was, if a baby survives an abortion, you can't kill the baby. And you have to transfer the baby to a hospital, right? Because guess what? Abortion clinics are not created to preserve life. They're created to end life. So you have to transfer the baby to a hospital. Then you are required by law to treat that baby with the same level of medical attention and care as you would treat any other baby born in normal circumstances. Does that sound pretty reasonable? It sounds pretty reasonable to me. Do you want to know why I told you that story? Well, these bills have to be voted, voted on, don't they? Every Republican senator voted for that bill. Only three Democrat senators voted for that bill. Now, I'm not here to say Jesus is Republican or Jesus is a Democrat. That's not what this is about. I'm not here to make political arguments. What I'm here to say is that you need to know that one party refuses to even protect babies born alive during botched abortions. So you as Christian students, you face challenges on the cultural level, the university level, and the political level. How many of you by right now by raise of hands would say that you feel equipped and confident to engage with this type of culture and defend your pro-life beliefs? Do you see why you're here? Do you see why rethink is so important? And you know what? At 17 years old, had I been asked that question, I wouldn't have raised my hand. I wouldn't have felt equipped to engage with this type of culture. But we as Christians are called to defend life and to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So I have good news for you this morning, friends. By the end of this morning, my hope is that you can all raise your hands and then provide you with resources to continue training yourself so that you can always raise your hand to that question and to say, yes, I am equipped and prepared to defend life. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, defending life. This is significant, friends, because we live in a world that does not value the lives of the children in the womb. They even celebrate a mother's right to kill her baby. In January, the state of New York legalized abortion to the day of birth. And there was a video that trended on Twitter of all of the senators in New York rising up and clapping and cheering and heckling after they legalized abortion to the day of birth. 
Our culture does not value the lives of unborn children, friends. We as Christians need knowledge on how to engage in the battlefield of abortion and defend life. So to be prepared to engage with this type of culture, you as Christian students need to be clear on four very important questions. And I'm going to train you and show you how to answer these four questions this morning in a gracious and persuasive manner. The first question is, what is the unborn? What is the unborn? Now, firstly, again, by raise of hands, how many of you think that the issue of abortion is complicated? How many of you think that abortion is a complicated issue? Okay, thank you. Many of us think it is. There's a lot of emotional baggage with the issue of abortion, isn't there? And sometimes as men, we feel like, well, maybe we can't talk about it. It's not our bodies. And we hear all of the arguments from culture about defending the pro-choice position. It can be very complicated or confusing, but it turns out that the issue of abortion is actually not complex at all. And it only comes down to one question and one question only. And to illustrate how the abortion debate is really just about one question, I want to tell you a little anecdote, all right, a little story to help you, to show you what that one question is, okay? I want you to imagine that you've graduated high school, You've met the man or woman of your dreams in college. You've graduated college. You've gotten married. You've had a couple kids. I know it sounds like an eternity away. And you have a little town home in somewhere in California. Okay. You're standing at your kitchen sink cleaning dishes one evening because God hasn't blessed you with a dishwasher, unfortunately. And your three-year-old toddler walks up behind you. Your back is turned and your little toddler says, Mommy or Daddy, can I kill this? Now, what's going to be the first question out of your mouth in response to your toddler's question, can I kill this? And what is it? You guys are smart. Yeah. You must have passed the qualifications to get to rethink. Exactly. Because if you turned around and your toddler was holding a cockroach, dad might say, here, son, quick, here's a hammer. Don't tell mom. But if he was holding the neighbor kitty, you might have a different reply. Unless you hate cats, in which case, no judgment. (laughs) But if he was holding his little sister by the throat, you need counseling. (laughs) So you couldn't answer the question, can I kill this, until you answered the question, what is it, right? We can't answer the question, can we kill the unborn? Because everyone agrees abortion kills something. Until we answer the question, what is the unborn? You guys hear Greg Coco last night? Awesome, right? Here's what Greg Kokel once said. If the unborn are not human, no justification for abortion is necessary. If they're not human, you don't need to justify abortion. It's no different than clipping your fingernails in that case. And then he said, however, if the unborn are human, no justification for abortion is adequate. You can't justify abortion if the thing being aborted is a human being. Very helpful. The whole abortion debate comes down to the question, what is the unborn? And we can use this one question to simplify the abortion debate so that you're equipped to defend life. Instead of shrinking back in fear because you don't know how to engage, you can simplify the debate and drive it back to the only question that really matters, which is what is the unborn? And you can use this in your tactics in conversations to defend life as well. And it's a very helpful strategy called trot out the toddler. This tactic is simply applying a pro-choice argument to the killing of a toddler and then asking your pro-choice friend if they still like that reasoning. And when they say no, you drive the debate back to the question, what is the unborn? Correct, because we shouldn't be killing toddlers. So if you reject killing toddlers, you should reject killing unborn babies because they are also human beings. Here's what I mean by that. I want to give you an example. Let's say your pro-choice friend or classmate or family member says, well, you know what? You really shouldn't be telling women that they can't get abortions. You shouldn't be intruding in their private matters. That's a privacy issue. Only the pregnant mother and maybe the boyfriend or husband should be making that decision. How dare you intrude in their private decisions? And you gently smile and respond with this question. Should we allow parents to kill their toddlers as long as they do so in the privacy of their own homes? It's a privacy issue. How dare you intrude into parents' living rooms where the parents are discussing whether to rip the limbs off of their toddler? How dare you intrude in those private matters? And what's your pro-choice friend going to say? Ugh, what? You can't kill toddlers. Why? Why? Well, because toddlers are human beings, aren't they? 
So if privacy is a bad argument for killing toddlers, guess what? It's also a bad argument for killing unborn children. If those unborn children are human beings. Do you see how the whole debate is really about what is the unborn? It's not about privacy, it's not about finances, it's not about women's bodies, it's not about men needing to stay silent, it's not about politics, it's about what is the unborn. And guess what? We know how to answer that question really, really well. I'm gonna show you how to answer that question so you can defend life. Because again, if it's not a baby, and it's just a blob of tissue, nobody cares. But if it's a human being, we should all be committed to protecting those human beings because the unborn children in our midst are the most defenseless. Babies are always the most defenseless. If they're part of us, we need to rise up as Christians to defend them. So let's answer the question, what is the unborn? We as Christians answer that question, believe it or not, not by turning to the Bible, but by turning to science. Because all truth is God's truth. The Bible doesn't have to say abortion is wrong for us to know that it's wrong. The Bible condemns abortion because abortion is wrong. Abortion isn't wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. It's the other way around because all truth is God's truth. So we can turn to science, which is God's truth, objective science, to answer this question, what is the unborn? Here's what the science of embryology teaches us, friends. Embryology, the study of the embryo, the biology of human beings when they're in their mother's wombs. The science of embryology says that from the moment of conception, the unborn child is a distinct, living, and whole human being. Distinct, living, and whole. Guess what? I didn't come up with those terms. These are terms you'll find in any biology textbook, in any embryology textbook, on any university campus, to answer the question, what is the unborn? They're distinct. Distinct means separate, right? Distinct means unique. But what have we heard about abortion? My body my choice. That argument assumes that how many bodies are involved? One. My body, my choice. Well, the science of embryology tells us that the unborn child is distinct, meaning different, unique, not part of their mother's body. The unborn child has their own unique DNA code. They could have a different blood type than the mother. And if unborn children are part of their mother's bodies, guess what? Now pregnant women have 20 fingers, 20 toes, two brains, two hearts, two different DNA codes, potentially two different blood types. Oh, and if she's pregnant with a boy, now pregnant women have penises. Does anyone like where that reasoning leads? No, and you all chuckle because you recognize the self-evident truth that the baby is a baby. The body in your body is not your body. They're a distinct, separate, unique human being. That's what the science of embryology teaches us. So we don't have to make religious arguments. We don't have to make political arguments. Let's look at what objective science teaches us. Distinct and living. Living means not dead. The unborn child meets all of the requirements for a living thing. Dead things don't grow. And the baby develops themselves from within. They develop themselves. They are a living human being. Now I have a one and a half year old. He's actually coming up on two. So I watched my wife be pregnant, right? And it was a much easier journey for me, by the way. It was pretty fun. So I watched everything she went through. I was at the appointments. I saw my son getting bigger in the womb. Here's something that never happened. My wife never woke up shaking me in the middle of the night saying, Seth, wake up, wake up. We have to remind our baby to grow. Her hurry, whisper to my womb and remind him to grow. Why is that so silly? Because... Parents don't will their unborn children to grow. Guess what? They develop themselves. So they're living. Distinct, living, and whole. W-H-O-L-E, not a hole in the ground, a whole human being. What does that mean? A whole human being is not a fully developed human being. We have a tendency to confuse those, those terms. A whole human being is a human being who has everything they need to realize their full growth and development as a participating member of the human race. Here's what I mean by that. I'm 28. I'm not 40. Do I have everything I need in my biologically coordinated human system to realize my development as a 40-year-old? Yeah, unless I'm dismembered. Unless I'm killed. Which is what abortion does. How many of you are teenagers? Guess what? You're not 21. Do you have everything you need to realize your development as a 21-year-old? Yeah, <laughs> you're on your way. You're going to get there. You just need time. Unless someone kills you, 
The same is true with abortion. From the moment of conception, the unborn child has everything they need to realize their full growth and development is one of us. They just need time, unless they're killed, which is exactly what abortion does to every baby in the womb, unless they're an abortion survivor. So you didn't come from an embryo and then turn into a different species. You once were an embryo. Embryo, fetus, infant, toddler, teenager. These are all words that describe human beings at a certain level of development. This is what the science teaches us. If you want to answer the question, what is the unborn, so that you can defend the life of those unborn children, this is what it teaches us. They're human beings. We all know this. This is plain, undisputed, scientific fact. This is not about religious opinions or political opinions. This is plain, objective science. So if you're going to be prepared to engage and defend life, you have to be clear on the question, what is the unborn? Secondly, we need to be clear on the question, what is abortion? Because as wonderful as it is to talk about the beauty of life in the womb, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the reality that 60 million babies have been ripped limb from limb since 1973 in their mother's womb. We need to define abortion. We need to understand what abortion is because it is the greatest human rights violation in human history. Roe versus Wade and the abortion juggernaut make Hitler and Stalin look like toddlers playing in a sandbox. Abortion has taken far more lives of human beings than Stalin or Hitler could have ever dreamed of taking. We need to understand what abortion is and does. Here is my simple definition for abortion. Abortion is the intentional killing of the unborn child. The intentional killing of the baby in the womb. Why do I use those words? Because, friends, abortions are not accidents. What would that be called? Miscarriage, that's right. A miscarriage, by its definition, is accidental. Abortion, by its very definition, is not accidental. You have to schedule an abortion. You have to show up. You have to take a pill that either kills your baby or have your cervix dilated so that forceps can be inserted up your birth canal and rip your baby limb from limb. Does that sound accidental? Abortion is the intentional killing of the baby in the womb created in the image of God. But it is very difficult to talk about something as horrific as abortion, you guys, if we never have to look at it, if we've never seen it. So we're going to give you an opportunity, an optional opportunity this morning to look at what abortion does to every baby created in the image of God. Now, we, we're going to give you a warning beforehand that this clip is graphic and disturbing. Do you know why it's graphic and disturbing? because abortion is graphic and disturbing. These are not doctored images or pro-life propaganda used to create emotional responses in you. This is the reality. This is what God has seen a billion times worldwide since 1980. Now, if you'd like to opt out of this presentation, you have the complete freedom to do so. It's only 55 seconds, okay, it's very short, and there's actually instrumental music so that if you avert your gaze or close your eyes, guess what? You're not even going to hear anything you don't want to hear, okay? So no one's being tripped or tricked or manipulated or pressured into watching this. You can have the complete freedom to close your eyes. When the music ends, you can open your eyes, and you won't have seen anything you wouldn't have wanted to see, okay? But we're going to give you the opportunity because we need a God's eye perspective of what happens to every baby in the womb. So let's play this brief video clip. Dear friends, every single one of those abortions was entirely legal. Perfectly legal. 
Our culture calls that procedure reproductive health care. Or as one presidential candidate recently said, reproductive justice. It's just a fight for the dismemberment of babies. So you guys, next time you hear someone say, I'm pro-choice, or I'm pro-abortion, or I support a woman's right to choose, I want you to picture that choice, okay? That's what happens to every baby in an abortion. With the exception of that final clip, all of that imagery was imagery from first trimester abortions. The first trimester is the first three months of the baby's development. Guess what? Over 90% of the American public supports first trimester abortions. Do you know why they justify their support of just the first trimester? Just a blob of tissue. It's not a person. It's not a baby yet. It's just tissue. Did that look like tissue to you? This is what God sees 3,000 times a day in the United States of America, a country that was founded on the idea of the right to life. Liberty in the pursuit of happiness. Guess what? You don't get those other rights if you're not alive, if you're dead. But we don't show you this imagery to, to shame you or condemn you, okay? We don't show this to make anyone feel bad if they've had an experience with abortion. That's not our heart. Our heart is to help you answer the question, what is the unborn, by knowing what abortion does to the unborn, so that you're equipped to engage the culture of death and defend life. That's our heart in showing you this imagery. Now, if you've had an abortion, if you've been complicit in an abortion, if you're a man and you pressured an abortion or paid for an abortion or stood by and said, you do you, I'll support you either way. I want to remind you of what I believe Jesus Jesus would tell you. I believe Jesus would sit in this room and stare you in your face and say, I am just as eager to forgive the sin of abortion as any other sin. I am eager to lavish out my grace and mercy on you. And do you know which figure in scripture best represents that reality? King David, a man after God's own heart. Did he have some spiritual speed bumps in his journey with the Lord? There was one in particular that was a pretty big speed bump. Instead of fighting on the front lines with his troops as he should have been, he was hanging out on his roof at his castle and he sees a woman taking a shower. He begins to enjoy feasting on her with his eyes and he decides that that's not enough. And so he brings her into his room. They have sex. A baby is created from that union. And now King David is forced with trying to cover up and hide his sexual sin. What does King David do? He arranges the death of an innocent human being. He arranges to have Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, murdered to cover up and hide his sexual sin. Abortion is the arranging of the death of an innocent human being, friends. And whether you obtained an abortion to hide or cover up sexual sin or not, the end result is the same. The end result is a dead innocent baby created in the image of God. But when the prophet Nathan confronted David, do you remember? David repented. He fell on his knees and asked for grace. And God was faithful and just to lavish out his grace on him. Called him a man after his own heart. But there were consequences to David's sin, weren't there? His baby died. His baby conceived with Bathsheba died. And he said, Regarding his dead baby, his dead son, he said, my son will not return to me, but I will go to him. Do you know what that means? That means that if you've had an abortion and you cry out for the grace of Jesus and you repent and ask for forgiveness, not only is Jesus faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you and renew you and redeem you, but it also means that you're going to see your baby in heaven again one day. And they're seated on the lap of Jesus, waiting to welcome you with a hug into glory. That's what that means. Jesus is just as eager to forgive the sin of abortion as any other sin. So if you've had an abortion or played a part in an abortion, hear that and receive that and come talk to me afterwards if you need to begin a journey of healing. We have people we work with who walk through men and women through a journey of healing who've had an abortion. So if you're going to be equipped to engage, you have to be clear on the question, what is the unborn? Who are they? And we can answer that with the science of embryology. Secondly, we have to be clear on the question, what is abortion? Is it reproductive health care? Is it feminism? Is it women's rights? Or is it the greatest human rights violation in human history that has taken the lives of one billion babies worldwide since 1980? Which is it? What is abortion? It's the intentional killing of the unborn baby. Thirdly, friends, we need to be clear on the question, what makes humans valuable? 
Why are we valuable? In other words, why should you care? Why should you care that a billion babies have been killed through abortion since 1980? Who cares if they're not valuable? So what makes humans valuable in the first place? And as Christians, we do need to start with where the Bible starts. What does the Bible teach about human value? The Bible teaches us that human value is intrinsic and not instrumental. I'm going to tell you what those big words mean. Intrinsic means it's part of who you are. It's in virtue of being a human to have value. That's what intrinsic means. You are intrinsically valuable human beings, and you had that value from the moment of conception along with every other baby. That's what intrinsic means. We understand that human beings are intrinsically valuable. Here's why we all understand that. We all understand there's a big difference between you murdering your uncle and you murdering a cow and having a hamburger. We all understand there's a big difference there, huh? If you eat your uncle, you have problems. If you eat a hamburger, I don't think you have problems. Why? Because cows are not intrinsically valuable. You are an intrinsically valuable human being. And you had that value from the moment of conception. That's what intrinsic means. The Bible teaches that your value is intrinsic and not instrumental. Meaning, your value is not based on what you can do. It's not based on what you look like. It's not based on your capacities or your functions. That's a very dangerous worldview. Because when we start basing human value on functions, or capacities, or talents, or skin color, or gender, or age, then we dehumanize all human beings. Because all of us differ according to age, and to size, and to gender, and to skin color. So the Bible says that your value is not instrumental. It's not based on what you can or cannot do. It's based on who you are. That's what the Bible teaches about human value. And we find this in the beginning of the human story, don't we? What does Genesis say? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The same God who breathed out stars into the heavens, who breathed out the Milky Way, breathed life into you. You bear the image and imprint of the creator of the universe. This is called the Imago Dei, the image of God. This is how the Bible explains human value. And so because the Bible says that you are an intrinsically valuable human being who bears the image of God, the Bible says, don't shed innocent blood. Don't kill innocent people. Why? Because they are image bearers of God. That's how the Bible makes sense of human value. So in Exodus 23, 7, it says, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent. Don't shed innocent blood. Jesus teaches the same thing in Matthew 5, 21. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be liable to judgment. Don't kill innocent people because just they, just like you, bear the image of their maker. But friends, how do we communicate this value, this truth, to people in our lives who don't believe in the authority of Scripture? How do you make an argument for the value of the baby in the womb to someone who's not a Christian, who says, I don't believe in the authority of the Bible. I don't believe in the image of God. And the good news is, is that we can make a very persuasive, compassionate, and airtight case and defense of our unborn neighbor's value without citing Bible verses to make our case. And the way we're going to do that is through a simple acronym that goes by SLED. That's the acronym. This is how we're going to defend the value of unborn children without making biblical arguments. SLED, S-L-E-D. It's a very difficult concept for us Southern California people because we don't even know how to spell the word snow. But uh, track with me. The acronym is SLED. And it stands for the four differences between unborn people and born people. And I'm going to go through each one of, of them with you. Because here is our argument for the value of the unborn child. There's no meaningful difference between you, the embryo, and you, the young adult, that makes it okay to kill you, the embryo. Does that make sense? There's no value-giving difference between embryos, unborn people, and born people that makes it okay to kill unborn people. But are there differences between the embryo that you used to be at four weeks old in the womb and you teenagers today? If I held up a, a prenatal unborn photo of you next to your face now, would it look different? Of course. So there are differences between unborn people and born people. Here's the argument. None of those differences matter. 
None of those differences are relevant to human value. None of those differences explain human value. And none of those differences can be used against you to justify killing you. The only four differences are SLED. Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. Don't worry, I'm going to go through each one. I know that was fast. SLED. S stands for size. Yes, it's true. The unborn child is smaller than the newborn child. Just like newborn children are smaller than toddlers, and toddlers are smaller than teenagers. Just like me at six foot three and 200 pounds, am larger than maybe let's say 98% of the students in here. Do I have more value than the rest of you under 6'3"? Do I have a greater right to life than you? No, you should be shaking your head. Of course I don't. Human beings are all valuable, regardless of their size. But what do people say about abortion who defend abortion? Oh, you mean the baby in the womb? Oh, I mean, you mean that blob of tissue at four weeks that you can't really even see? How could that have value? They dehumanize babies because they're smaller. But if we would reject killing born people who are smaller, we have to equally reject killing unborn people simply because they're smaller. If what? If they're human beings. If they share our common human nature. And the science of embryology says that they are human beings. So size is not a relevant factor to human value, is it? Okay, L, level of development. Yes, it's true, the unborn child is less developed than the newborn child. Just like newborn children are what? Less developed than toddlers? Toddlers are less developed than teenagers? You're less developed than me because you're all in the teenagers or early 20s? You're less developed than me because I'm older. Does that mean I have more value than you? Nope. What, what, how would you feel if your parents said they have more value than you because they're older? Doesn't sit well with teenagers. So our value is not based on our level of development, is it? What about your younger siblings? Do they have less value than you? You might feel like that sometimes, but they certainly don't. They have equal value, don't they? And if someone was seeking to abuse, mistreat, or kill your younger sibling, what would you do? You would defend them, because human value is not based on level of development. But what do people say about unborn children who, who call themselves pro-choice? Well, we can kill the baby in the womb because they can't feel pain, they're not viable, they're not conscious, they can't survive outside the womb, they don't have brain activity. Those are all functions that come along with what? A level of development, right? But if we would reject killing born people because they're less developed than us, we have to equally reject killing unborn people simply because they're less developed than us. If what? If they're human beings. What is the unborn? It's a human being from the moment of conception. So you can't justify killing babies in the womb just because they're smaller or less developed. Because we wouldn't justify killing you simply because you're smaller or less developed. E, environment. Environment or location. Environment, where you find yourself. Where are you? Yes, it's true. The unborn child is what? Located in a very unique environment. His or her mother's womb. By the way, the womb is where you were meant to be. The womb is where the baby is supposed to be. We all came from wombs. We're all unaborted. We made it, but we all started in the womb. But where one is has no bearing on who one is. Your value is not dependent on where you find yourself, on your location. And the United States of America says that if you're located six inches away in your mother's womb, you can be dismembered and ripped limb from limb or given cardiac abortions through the day of birth because hashtag feminism and women's rights. But once you move six inches from the womb during childbirth into the doctor's waning hands, congratulations, human rights, you're now valuable. Does that make any sense to you? It shouldn't because human value is not based on location. Guess what? We're all in different locations. The distance between those of you in the back and me down here is a pretty far distance. It's a significantly further distance than the unborn child travels during childbirth, six inches. Where one is has no bearing on who one is. Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. Dependency. Are you dependent on someone else for your life? Is the unborn dependent on the mother? Yeah. And in the first trimester, the first three months, and the second trimester, or the early second trimester, that unborn baby cannot survive apart 
from their connection to the mother. They require their dependency on their mother to continue living. Human value is not based on dependency. And many people in our country today will say that abortion is okay as long as the baby is dependent on the mother. And then they'll say once the baby is independent, once the baby can survive and be born and not be dependent on the mother, then it's wrong to kill them. So human value is only based on your dependency. Once you're independent, then you have human value. But guess what? Born people are dependent on heart pacemakers, kidney machines, insulin, and sometimes life support. Is it okay to kill them because they're dependent on something without which they cannot continue to live? Of course not, because human value is not based on dependency. By the way, infants who are just born are just as dependent as unborn children. Maybe they can survive outside the womb with help. They're still dependent. My one and a half year old would kill himself if I left him alone for an hour. He's still dependent. So we can't base human value on dependency. So if we wouldn't kill you, born people, simply because you're smaller, less developed, located elsewhere, and more dependent, we also shouldn't be killing unborn people simply because they're smaller, less developed, located elsewhere, and more dependent. Notice, I just made a case for the value, the equal human value of the unborn child to you and I. And I did it without citing Bible verses to make my case because all truth is God's truth. So we can defend God's truth that the unborn child has value without citing Bible verses. So we can persuade and winsomely engage with the non-Christians in our life who currently celebrate abortion. So look around the room, friends. Look at one another and ask yourself the question, what makes humans valuable? What makes you valuable? Is it found in your athleticism, your artistic talents, your age, your skin color, your ethnicity? Is it found in those things? No, because we all differ according to those things. It's found in the fact that the only thing we have in common is a common human nature. We're all human beings. It's only by grounding human value in our human nature that we can defend all human beings' right to life, regardless of their differences. Now, how many of you still think by raise of hands that abortion issue is complicated? Good. How many of you now feel equipped to engage and defend your pro-life beliefs? Good. By driving the whole debate back to the question, what is the unborn? And then taking any pro-choice argument you hear and using it as an argument to kill toddlers and seeing if the argument still works. If it doesn't, then maybe we shouldn't be accepting the reasoning in the first place. That's how we can defend life. So if you want to be equipped to engage on the battlefield of abortion and be a voice for the unborn, we have to be clear on the question, what is the unborn? What is abortion? What makes humans valuable? And lastly, what is our duty? As followers of Jesus, what is our duty in a country that says it's legal to kill babies to the moment of birth? Well, I think that the parable of the Good Samaritan in Scripture is one of the best examples and stories of the duty of Christians to love others, to love neighbors. You know the parable, don't you? A man's traveling on the road. He gets robbed and beaten and mugged and left half dead, bleeding out on the side of the road. As he's sitting there, half dead, a couple religious men walk by, don't they? A Levite and a priest. People who would have agreed that human beings bear the image of God. And what did they do? They walked by on the other side of the road. Maybe they were personally opposed to beating people up. Maybe they felt compassion for the bleeding victim. But they didn't take compassion. They didn't show compassion. It was the good Samaritan, the bleeding victim's natural enemy. Because remember, Jews and Samaritans hated one another who loved his neighbor. Luke's gospel says when he saw the bleeding victim, he felt compassion? No, he showed compassion. His faith evidenced itself in works. He poured oil and wine on the man's wounds. He bandaged the man's wounds. He put the man on his own donkey so he had to walk. He nursed him back to health. He took him to the nearest inn. Then he told the innkeeper, I have to go now. When I come back, I'm going to pay you for any other costs that accumulated in caring for this man while I was gone. Radical sacrifices of his time his energy, and his money. 
to love a bleeding victim. Friends, the unborn child is our bleeding victim. That's not to denigrate other social issues. That's to say that simply they are the number one bleeding victim. One million babies killed a year through abortion in the United States of America. They are our bleeding victim. We need to be their good Samaritans. We are called to love our neighbors, but sometimes it's costly to love our neighbors, isn't it? Because guess what? The Bible's definition of neighbor doesn't allow us to leave anyone out. So the guy you hate, your sibling when he's ticking you off, your parents when you're mad at them, the bully at school, the Bible says they're all neighbors. So sometimes it's costly to love neighbors because it requires us to love our enemies and it requires us to be unselfish and love others who need our help. Sometimes it's costly. It may be costly for you as students right now to engage on the battlefield of abortion because it's going to take time to master the pro-life view. I don't expect you to remember everything I said this morning. In fact, I'm sure you won't. But we'll have a recording available to you. You can listen to this. You can train your mind to engage and defend life. It's going to take time to gird up your loins, put on the armor, and engage on the battlefield of abortion. And I'm here to help you do that. You can follow me on social media, on Facebook, at Seth Gruber. I have a podcast called Unaborted. And it's simply the idea that you're all here because you were unaborted. So how can we as unaborted human beings who are grateful for our lives defend the lives of other unborn children who have abortion threatening their very existence? I have one episode a week equipped to engage you to defend life. You can follow that on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes podcast, or Google Play podcast. I have a website, sethgruber.com, that has a blog. It has resources. It has training videos to equip you to engage. There are tools available to you to take time to master the pro-life view. Secondly, it might be costly for you because it won't be popular. If you attend a secular university campus, you will be in the minority being pro-life. It will not be popular. And you may have to count some costs for your pro-life position. But this is what I want to remind you of, friends, and leave you with, is that any cost you have to count for defending the lives of little babies in the womb is not going to be any greater than the cost that Jesus, the greater good Samaritan, already paid for you. He is the greater good Samaritan. In the parable of the good Samaritan, we're the bleeding victim, folks. We're the one bleeding out through our sin and choices. Choosing our own way. Jesus is the good Samaritan who comes to us, his enemies who are opposed to him, and loves us lavishly with his grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Proverbs 31.8 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. That's certainly true of the unborn, and we should speak up for them. But you know what the deeper truth of that verse is, friends? We are also those who cannot speak up for themselves. We are similar to the unborn in our spiritual state, in that we cannot speak up for ourselves. Not one of us can vouch for ourselves and say, actually, <clears throat> Jesus, check me out. Perfect record, baby. Open up the gates of heaven. None of us can say that. We are utterly incapable of vouching or speaking up for ourselves. But 1 John 2 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anybody does sin, which we all will and have, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Who's an advocate? Someone who speaks up for someone else. So if Christ spoke up for us when we were utterly incapable of doing so, how can we not speak up for the unborn who are equally unable to speak up for themselves? You see, pro-life activism and the positioning of the pro-life position is simply the proper response to the gospel. It's not humanitarian efforts that we force ourselves to engage in. It's merely the proper response of the heart to the gospel. We love because he first loved us. We seek to love women and fathers and save their unborn children from death because we've been loved and saved from eternal death. What is our duty? Our duty is to love our neighbors and the unborn child is our neighbor. So friends, hear the final words of Jesus in the parable of the good Samaritan. And rather than picturing the bleeding victim who got beat up, I want you to picture the bleeding unborn victim. I want you to picture the baby whose limbs you saw ripped from their body today. Picture that bleeding victim and hear Jesus' final words to the lawyer in the parable of the good Samaritan. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the bleeding victim? He told Jesus, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Friends, pray with me.
Father, thank you that you are the author and perfecter of our faith, but you're also the author of life, the same God who breathed out the Milky Way, breathed life into every human being in this room. Thank you for making us so wonderfully complex that our frame was not hidden from you when we were woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw all of our days before they were made, and you ordained each of them with a purpose. You don't make accidents. And you love and see and mourn the loss of every baby who's aborted in our country and in the world. Give us the grace, compassion, and courage to engage. Help our minds to remember these things so that we can be more effective salt and light and ambassadors for the unborn neighbors in our midst. We can't do this without you. Send us out equipped to engage and bless these students as they step out in faith. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, well, I hope that was helpful for you. I hope that was a blessing to you. Hey, as you probably heard from my talk at Standard Reasons Rethink Conference, I asked the students how many of them prior to my presentation had heard a presentation before equipping them to defend their pro-life beliefs. And the response was almost nothing. So if this was helpful and encouraging to you, please share this with, um, with young people in your life. Please share this with Christian educators, parents, and pastors who need to be hearing this content and then giving that to their young people, the next generation of Christian leaders and hopefully the pro-life generation that will end the slaughter of our unborn neighbors in their mother's womb. So I hope this was helpful. And hey, the way we're able to reach more people with this kind of content, expand the reach of this show, bring on guests, increase our production value, and put this type of content in front of young people on social media is through your help. So if you want to help expand the reach of this show, please consider becoming a patron. Simply go to patreon.com slash unaborted and become a patron of the show for five, ten, fifteen dollars a month that will help us bring you more content as well as push this out to the people who really need it, who need to be equipped to be defenders of life and who once they hear the defense and beauty of life are much more likely to actually engage and be defenders of life themselves. For further content, go to my website at sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com for my newsletter, my training videos and to get my speaking schedule if you want to come hear me speak live and locally. Thanks so much for tuning in. I will see you next week. This is Seth Gruber with Unaborted.